Welcome. Thanks, Mike. Wow. I love Golang, UK. This is uh, an absolute pleasure to, to be here. Um, it was like, it's even more of a pleasure than, um, than the last time I had so much fun. Um, and I really love the, the, the sort of the go scene in, in London as well. Um, and I know there's a lot of people internationally here as well, so I think it's a fantastic conference. So what I want to talk to you today about is, um, is HashiCo and why we bet on Go. Because back when we were kind of making those decisions, this was a big thing. Today, Go, like, no questions, right? Any questions? No questions. It's an amazing language. Do I need to do this slide? Does anybody not know who, who HashiCore are or what we do? Awesome. So we do a bunch of stuff. Now, there's one product on there which is not written in Go, and that's Vagrant. And we're going to explain to you how we sort of moved from that, that base through to a language that we now love, and some of the things that we, we kind of particularly love about it and yeah, of course, maybe some of the things that don't go so well. We have enterprise products as well now. So if you, um, if you do use our products, please um, buy the enterprise licenses so I can continue to, uh, to do a job that I love to do. Okay. So that's me. Um, this is me. A little bit shorter hair. The crow is gone, but I'm a developer advocate and I work for HashiCorp. And um, I wrote a book thing as well. But I've been working in the industry for like 20 years now. So I've seen like quite a few different trends and, and a few different things coming and going. I've worked with um, scripting languages. Um, I still get requests for PHP contract positions on LinkedIn. Um, it was only 20 years ago, so I suppose that's still relevant in the, in the eyes of LinkedIn. But um, I've worked on a few things, and, and I, I kind of worked a lot with C Sharp. And, and that was a language that I, that I really, really, really liked. And one of the things I really liked about C Sharp was that it started to introduce to me some things which I'd never really approached before, some sort of like complex object-oriented features and techniques. I looked at things like abstraction, and I looked at things like inheritance and polymorphism, and I was like a child in a sweet shop. I mean, this was like amazing to me. And I say I used to love that stuff, but actually what I managed to create was a spider's web of code which literally only Napalm could fix. And then I found Go. And Go was kind of like a very different approach to what I was used to with working with, with, with C Sharp. And C Sharp was, was featured, whereas Go was very light. And at HashiCore, we like those features of the language. We like the fact that Go can be used to create these incredibly high performance systems. We like the fact that it's super easy to learn. And we actually like the fact that there's no magic. We also like the fact that it's highly opinionated. Now, I'm a software engineer. If I didn't have opinions, I couldn't call myself a software engineer. But I actually like not having that conflict of opinions around a language. Because those have been dictated to me by the team that's developed the language. They, that's something, I just get on with the job. And I love the ecosystem in Go. I love the, the open source. I love the people who are writing the tooling. Just like everything works. And for us, that was like a really key feature. So we do two different types of application. We do desktop applications. When I say desktop, 
We build CLIs. And we do server-side applications, highly distributed server-side applications, so things that are capable of running tens and tens of thousands of nodes. And when we were looking at a language and, and what we wanted with a language, we, we wanted a language which enabled easy deployment. We wanted to allow people to, to be able to trial our software and to be able to do it without fuss or, or packages or dependency. We wanted something most importantly for us that could be run everywhere. We wanted that capability to be able to run on multiple platforms, different variants of Linux, different architectures, running things on Windows. We wanted that run anywhere capability and we wanted it without fuss. So when kind of Mitchell and Armand were, were sitting down and they were saying, well, should we move to Go? What are the alternatives? So like at the time, Vagrant was our, our core product. That was the one thing that we had out there. And Vagrant was very much Ruby based. Now Ruby's fine if you've got Ruby installed, but one of the things that we had an, a major issue with, with Vagrant was packaging it. I mean, we were doing things like packaging up the Ruby VM inside of our, our Vagrant packages to try and save people the hassles. And that was just a problem which, which we couldn't kind of scale when we started to, to, to sort of focus on the other areas of the product vision. So we looked at things like Erlang, and, and Erlang was VM-based. We didn't really want that. We wanted that single binary dependency. Rust was a consideration, but Go's garbage collection just really kind of worked for us. And, and I think it was Armand who suggested that we, we could actually use C or, or C++. And um, that, that option didn't stay on the table for very long, believe me. So 2012, this is when we first started to look at Go. So this was kind of Go 1.0. Two employees at HashiCorp, Mitchell and Armand. Then in 2013, we released Packer. And Packer was our first Go application. At the time, there were four employees. Now, when we started work on Packer in 2012, nobody was using Go, like nobody. But when we released Packer in 2013, like just about a month apart, so CoreOS came out, Docker released, that gave us great confidence that there were these other companies that were betting on the language as well and, and who were kind of working in a similar sort of distributed space, that infrastructure. Today, literally everything is Go. It's our, our core language. There's, there's actually very little chatter on things like Slack about should we maybe use a different language. We are fully embodied into Go as, as an ideal. And of course, I think one of the things that when you're building a company, right, not, not just building products, but there was a vision to build a company that were well, we worried that Go wouldn't scale with us. There was no Go developers at the time, right? I mean, there was Mitchell and Armand. They were probably one of the, 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 the few. And we knew that because of this product roadmap, we were going to need to hire a big team. And we knew that because of the kind of the complexity of the products and because of the, the kind of the ideals of the founders that we wanted to create the world's best Go team. But there was a big kind of thing which gave a lot of confidence and that was that just how easy it is to, to learn Go, how easy it is to kind of to start to, to adopt the language. And and I think that's partly attributable to the verbosity of the language. And a lot of times, people look at things like verbosity and it's like a bad thing, like dry is one of the core principles you get branded into you. But verbosity actually creates simplicity in some ways and it, and it creates readability. We, we quite like verbosity. And I've got a quote here from, from Rob Pike and, and this drew its fair share of uh, comments on, on Hacker News and Reddit when it, when it posted it, but I'll, I'll just quickly read it out. So he says, the key point here is our programmers are Googlers. They're not researchers. 
They're typically fairly young, fresh out of school. They probably learned Java, maybe learned C or C++, probably learned Python. They're not capable of understanding a brilliant language, but we want to use them to build good software. So the language that we give them has to be easy for them to understand and easy to adopt. Now, I'll take one point out of this which I disagree with, and that is not capable. I think everybody is capable of using a language. Everybody is capable of doing anything that they want to do. But I think what Rob really is getting at is that Go is easy. You don't need to worry about it. The language allows you to concentrate on features, not kind of mentally wrestling with the semantics of the language itself. And then, of course, you've got things like maintenance. You, you know you're going to have products. You know that those products are going to be around for quite a while. So what does Go give us in terms of that? Well, so at HashiCorp, right, we've, we've never had a build fail because we've upgraded a version of Go. That is an incredible testament to the team working on the core language. Now, it did take us some time to settle on a good style. And I think, again, put time into perspective here. We're back 2012, 2013. We didn't have the, the kind of the wonderful community that it exists today who are kind of able to advise us on the patterns and the idioms. A lot of reference that we had to take at those times was, was drawn out of things like the standard library. But we modernize all of the time. Some of that code still exists. And every time we see something which is a little bit maybe out of trend, we can modernize it. And the, the ability to use things like the fantastic test suite, the code being very, very easy to understand, it's very easy for us to keep updating those, those areas of code. And then there's the speed boosts, right? I mean, like, this has got to be the craziest thing in any language. We estimate that we've had a 10% speed boost in our applications from just upgrading Go. Like literally just upgrading from say 1.7 to 1.8 to 1.9, we'll get a 10% increase because of the optimizations that go into things like the garbage collection and the other elements. That is amazing. But then there's kind of like this, this everything shiny thing, right? I mean, I'm always reading Hacker News and, and looking for the next kind of cool thing. And when you're a company and you're kind of like saying, well, we're going to write all of our software in this, then were we worried that, that actually Go could have been a trend, that, that it could kind of just fizzle away into, into nothing, and then we'd be left with all of this language that, that we couldn't support? And not really. I mean, kind of like Mitchell looked at this stuff, and he said, I don't think there's anything in infrastructure that'll replace Go. And he stands by that quote. That was, that's recent. And, and Armin, one of the things that Armin really loves about the language is that it just doesn't allow you to shoot yourself in the foot. It's very difficult to make those catastrophic mistakes. So what do we love about the language? Well, concurrency. We're building distributed systems. Console is, is literally running out there in the wild on tens and tens of thousands of nodes. There's a heavy amount of threading going on in there. And could we have achieved something like console if we were building it on top of like POSIX threads or something? Like, probably but it would have required so much more engineering effort. There would have been so many more bugs in the software. But the concurrency patterns in Go are just so straightforward. They're so easy to use. It's the kind of stuff that you can literally just pick up and run with. And I think one of the other interesting sort of facets of the language, which is incredibly useful for us all is, is I mean, I, I, I've got interfaces, but what I predominantly mean is kind of like duct typing. I like the fact that an interface is not explicit, that I don't have to define it with implements or extends or you know, some other keyword that has to be on, on, on the class. And I like the fact that I can pick up a third-party package, 
which is not based on an interface, and I can write my own interface. I define my behavior of, of kind of how I want these things to work. If you've ever worked in a, in a language which, which is kind of very heavily sort of statically object-oriented and, and doesn't have a capability of duct typing, and if you've ever worked in a language where you, you kind of, you can't manage your dependencies because your dependencies are concrete types, and because the author of that particular dependency hasn't written an interface that you can actually write a, a mock or a stub around, then you're in kind of a, a world of pain. And there's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, I, I spent time shouting and swearing at the, the Android library when I was doing a bit of mobile development because some of the, the core kind of standard libraries are concrete types. There's no interfaces. So I have to wrap everything in an abstraction, which is just not fun. Go doesn't, we don't need to do that. That's amazing. And tuples. I think you pronounce it tuples, right? But this is a pattern. The, the, the ability to be able to return multiple parameters from a function is, is more valuable than, than, than you kind of realize. If you all kind of go as your first language and you've not worked with with, with another language which doesn't have this capability, then you kind of find yourself doing things like having to wrap, if you want to return multiple parameters, you have to wrap them up in another object. And again, it's down to the explicitness, right? I can look at that function signature and I can see exactly what's being returned. I don't need to drill in to find out that the object is being returned is actually just a container for another object and an error message. And the error messages, that, that verbosity around errors is actually one of my favorite things. I think the, the, the kind of the, the encouraging idiom of having that return something and then having a, f a final parameter as an error message, which forces you as a developer to think about what you're doing. It forces you as a developer to, to kind of handle that that case rather than just kind of lumping everything into a try catch all and hoping it works and then trying to be able to follow that code and work out what's going on at a later date. This is an incredibly great thing. I sometimes wish they didn't let you do this. Um, and if you read this, William Kennedy's got some great posts on why you should always explicitly handle your errors, including in your tests. But Now, single binaries, so I mentioned earlier, I, I sort of like talked about our need for being able to distribute our applications, being able to, to run things everywhere. For us, the, the kind of the, being able to compile a, a binary anywhere on any machine for a different architecture is an incredibly powerful thing. It saves a lot of hassle and a lot of trouble around trying to have complicated make or build, whatever you want to use for your, your sort of your build scripting. It also kind of saves a lot of the complexity around actually having to build on the architecture. So if I want to build on Windows, I need a Windows machine to be able to do that. And the, this capability of Go is, is a big thing. It's also a big thing for us that we can produce statically sort of compiled binary. So if you look at a lot of things like Nomad and Console and Vault, now they're Terraform, they're big complicated bits of software, but that's a single, single binary. If you want to install and run Nomad, all you need to do is grab a zip file, unzip the binary and run it. Nothing needs to be installed, uh, which really, really helps us when it comes to things like installation, so it helps our users, but it also helps us because it means that we can easily distribute our software. Channels, of course, kind of go in hand in hand with, with sort of concurrency models and leveraging those very, very, very heavily in, in products like Nomad and products like Console. It's really useful to have that, that very sort of, I suppose, easy to use. It's probably one of the more complicated areas of Go, but once you kind of get your head around it, to have that, that it's a very pleasant way to deal with 
And so up here I've got HTTP package, but actually what I kind of mean is just the entire of the standard library. So I don't know if, like, how if people realize just how fortunate we are to have such a, a, a wonderful standard library. I mean, having the capability to, to run kind of production level HTTP servers without needing to install any additional packages, having some fantastic crypto libraries, having some fantastic sort of low level OS libraries, I and mean, all of the abstraction is kind of managed for us. This is a, a, a big, big thing, and, and for us, because we're dealing with, with distributed, having that kind of networking, having that HTTP, um, HTTP and the sort of slightly higher level stuff, and having that as solid in the standard library is a great, great thing. I work with a little bit with Swift, and I like Swift as a language, but I really, really miss every time that I'm coding something in Swift and I've got a fish for a package, and all I want to do is spin up a web server. This is a fantastic design. And then again, Go format. I don't really, I've never really enjoyed having those conversations around coding standards. Um, and the, the reason I've never really enjoyed them so much is because I, I kind of never really enjoyed the, the conflict that can exist in some of those conversations that everybody has an opinion. And, and I've, in my experience, like whenever I've been in those conversations trying to sit down and, and decide a coding standard, it always gets a little bit heated because people are passionate. And, and I'm, I, A, I've never enjoyed that from a personal level. And B, it seems to have like just take up way too much time. But when you've got things like Go Format, which kind of like just says, hey, this is the way you're going to do it. Um, so you just defer that whole decision. It means that you get on, you write features, you're concentrating on the stuff that actually matters rather than junk about whether you should put a bracket on a new line or not. Generics. <laughs> I, so I, I don't even know where to go with this. I'm going to go with this by saying, I don't care about generics. And you can grab me in the stairwell and beat me up if you want afterwards, but <laughs> I'm making a stance on that, and, and the reason that I don't care about generics, I see the benefits of them, is that I like the simplicity. I'm not a smart guy. I, I kind of don't have an amazing memory. I like to be able to just kind of look at code and understand what's going on. And like sorting is, is one of the examples which, which is kind of cited quite a bit for a, a need of generics, parsing data structures and things like that. But I don't really hate that. I mean, yes, it, it causes me to spend 25 seconds writing some boilerplate code, but it's, it's very explicit. And, and actually, I'm not really sure that I, I like the Go 1.8 updates to to kind of sorting. I mean, I think the problem with, with doing this, and I think that this is a kind of an indication of where things could go if Go hit an implementation of generics, that it just doesn't become as, as explicit. So I have to look at the code and understand what's actually going on in the inner function to, to determine that that's sorting by name. Or I have to write a higher level abstraction and I have to push that out into a function to be able to have that, that very clear, very readable, just like a story, sort by age people. I like that. I don't want generics. I want that simple. So there are some bad parts. There's some bits which need work. Not a fan of errors. I think. The core problem with, with errors in the standard library is it's, it's just too basic. So the concept of, of kind of just using strings is, is fine, but you find yourself doing a lot of horrible stuff like having to wrap errors to be able to kind of bubble them across properly. Now, it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, Dave wrote the, the errors package, which is, is pretty awesome, and it gives you all of the capability of 
of being able to do that and, and to, to have that, that sort of stack trace when it comes to being able to read the error and use it. But I think one of the problems that, that we had with, with errors as, as being strings was localization. So we had a problem, and I, I, I must admit, I don't recall exactly where it was, but we had a bug reported from a user. And, and the user was saying, well, this is blowing up. And we're like, well, it can't blow up. We've, we've tested it. It's fine. And it was like, no, seriously, this is blowing up. So after a number of calls, we kind of bottle things down to the fact that this particular was user was using, I think, a, a Windows machine which had an Italian, um, the Italian language on it, which made sense because it was Italian. And what we were doing was we were, we were getting an error, error message back from a low-level package, and we were... We were basically grepping it for a string, which was in English. Well, of course, if the, if the underlying operating system is passing that message in a, a different language, if it is localizing it, and then we didn't realize that, then that's causing us a whole world of pain. We, we lacked something like a commonality, such as an error code, that, that where we don't have to gro grep a string. And I know the the kind of the standard library does sort of show you some better ways to do this. And, and I think this is a, a nice sort of way to do it, that if you're going to return an error from your package, don't just return a, a, a blind error without giving the, the, the user a way of kind of being able to do a, a string comparison. So the OS package will, will define things like error invalid, which of course is just an instance of error, but it it gives you as a user the capability of being able to do a comparison of error equals OS dot error invalid rather than OS error equals invalid argument or something like that. And logging. Logging, I think, is a, a problem which is semi-solved, but there's not something which is really very sort of promoted by the, the, the sort of the core, core team. It would be nice that there was a kind of a, maybe an, an interface or something which advised a little bit more guidance on, on logging. There, there seems to be a number of fantastic logging packages, all which take a different approach. And, and that can be kind of difficult when you want to, to replace it. It can also be difficult if you're using different packages, which you're using different loggers. And in terms of our products, we originally would end up using three different loggers because each product team is, is using something. But I think that would be nice, a nice advancement of the language to, to have something which is a little bit more promoted by the core team that we can settle a standard on. Vendoring, on a personal level, I've never really had a problem with vendoring. I would, I would kind of do a talk about Go a few years back and, and literally every question was, oh, well, how do you manage to, to run your code when you don't actually have a package manager as such? How do you vendor your libraries? And like, it was generally coming from the Java developers um, because Maven is so good. <laughs> um, but, you know, vendoring, I don't think vendoring was so much a problem. I mean, the, I like the premise that the, the, the kind of the core team put saying, well, you know what, you should always use the latest because you should be assuming the latest has the greatest features and all of the bug fixes and things like that. But I think as the, the ecosystem has grown and, and actually as we do have a more sort of community involvement, then that's, that's a very difficult kind of approach to take. And, and vendoring, like, yeah, whatever. There's so many great ways to do vendoring. GBs, Glide. We've now got DEP, which is coming. Um, had a prop was a problem. No, not. Okay, so if we had a time machine, if we could send ourselves back in time to 2013 and give ourselves advice on on what we would have done differently in in our approach to go, what would that have been? So Mitchell. His kind of core beef is around this. 
It's about focusing on certain problems, and those problems were the error packages and logging. We, we had too many different implementations. We didn't settle on a standard. And we tried to be very clever with Seago, so we spent a lot of time implementing Seago, and then we spent an even longer amount of time trying to unimplement it, because again, we want that distributability. For me, I looked at Go, and I was like, I don't like the way GoPath works. GoPath is wrong. I want a project-based structure. So I spent a lot of time trying to work around GoPath before ultimately conceding that Rob Pike was actually right and that GoPath isn't the worst thing in the world and it's actually a nice way to work. But I think this catches a lot of new developers out to the language. And Armand's advice is that, that Go favors verbosity. So don't try and dry things up too much. Cut and pasting is not that much of a challenge. And I think kind of like finally as well, one of the things that we, we, we kind of look at now, we say that, you know, we, we, we didn't really package things hard enough. We, we didn't have the wealth. I went and like Matt's talk, of an approach of packaging. And, and we didn't go about things, we didn't package things in enough depth. So some of the things around that were we, we kind of asking ourselves, yes, can it be reused? But we wouldn't necessarily take the first bullet. And I think the other thing around packaging where it was a, a useful indicator to us that something should be a package is when we were prefixing, if we were prefixing types or functions, then that, that kind of indicates that maybe that should be in a package and we can use the package as the prefix. And that's it for me. Now, if you can make it out of Austin, Texas, there's a little conference going on in September. It's going to be a bunch of fun. So, HashiConf. And and I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you very much for everybody who's out there contributing to, to Go, who's building open source packages, who make my life easy on a daily basis, for being an amazing community. And if there's any questions, please feel free. All right, do we have any, do we have any questions for Nick? One. Hi, um, really interesting. I, I use a lot of HashiCorp um, products really, really great they are. Um, how, do you, how did you find the approach to training developers from, obviously from going from one language to, to go? Yeah, we, we actually found it really easy. I mean, I think um, it was Mitchell or Armin and I, I asked them this question. They said that we think it's maybe like maybe one or two weeks I think to actually learn the, the, the sort of the semantics of the language itself, it's, it's an incredibly rapid thing. So if you're a, you're a kind of a company that's maybe thinking about going a little bit polyglot, then teaching new developers shouldn't really be a sort of a, a, a core concern. It is, it's a very quick language to get up to speed with. I think when I worked at Not on the High Street, we, we did a little bit of a migration to Go, and there's an amazing Go team there now. And a lot of the developers had never touched Go before, and I'm, I'm not actually sure if anybody had. A lot of Ruby, and, and now the, I think the Go contingent is, is almost more than, than, than Ruby. The, the sort of the adoption has been very, very quick, and a lot of people have really enjoyed the journey as well. So I think it's about kind of just following the basics, kind of just, you know, grokking things. There's some great books out there. I mean, there's, there's Go in Action. There's, there's the, the Kernighan book. The, um, spend a little bit of time, enjoy it, and, and kind of treat it like a bit of fun as well. So do learning lunches or... Good. Other questions? Uh, you were mentioning uh, that you don't really like the generics part there, and I agree with you that some of the code that you showed that looked better than what generics probably would look like. 
But have you guys had a lot of issues in terms of like having to pass interfaces around all the time and then just not being able to do that type checking? So the, the, the core problem we have with, with a lack of generics is, is predominantly around data, um, data object parsing. It's kind of like those, those ugly switch statements where you're having to kind of check, check types and, and do things like that. We, we don't have too much of a trouble with, with, with interfaces. Um, we, we try not to kind of have a function which, which might just be of type interface. We always try to sort of ensure things that are, are typed where possible because we find it's, it's, it's about the explanatory. But, um, but I think the, the area that the generics would be really, really useful for us would be around being able to kind of write sort of object parsers for when we're dealing with, with heavy amounts of data. All right, if you've bet your company on Go, put your hands together for Nick.